If there's one thing that can drive the popularity of a firearm, it's the movies, it's Hollywood, it's the silver screen. So today, Dave and I are gonna talk about some of the top 10 iconic movie guns that you saw when you were growing up. Hello, friends and lovers. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Ammunition Guide podcast brought to you by none other than Ammo.com. Now, usually me and Chris compare cartridges that have no right being compared to each other, but today we're going to talk about our favorite movie guns. Uh, Chris, I couldn't tell you the names of many actors, but every time I see a gun in a movie, I'm Googling it, I'm buying it. I love seeing these things depicted as unrealistically as possible by Hollywood elites who've never seen them before in their lives and have no idea how they work. No, you're absolutely right, Dave. There are just so many different firearms out there that are in the movies that we just love. And these are movies that we grew up watching. We watched them 50 times when we were kids. And now that we're adults, we can actually go out and get them. And before we get started, if you need ammo to load into any of these movie guns that, guns that you might own, make sure you click that link down in the description. Get your free $20 off coupon from here at ammo.com. But if there's one line in the movie that really sticks out to me, it has to be from the Army of Darkness, the this is my boomstick moment. When he's there in medieval times, he whips out his double barrel shotgun, blows a sword in half, and the line is, all right, you primitive screwheads, this is my boomstick. Now, it's interesting because the character Ash there identifies the, the sawed-off shotgun as a Remington when it's actually a Stoger 12-gauge coach gun that's been sawed off earlier in the movie. And, uh, man, this is, this is quite the scene. Let's take it back now to the Wild West, and we're going to talk about the movie Tombstone here. And if there's one iconic lawman out in the Wild West, it has to be Wyatt Earp. I mean, this guy is an absolute living legend. And during that iconic scene, right before the shootout at the OK Corral, he goes back to his room and he whips out none other than the Colt Peacemaker, which is actually the single action army. Now, this one was chambered in 45 Long Colt, or 45 Colt, depending on who you ask. Developed in 1873, was actually the cavalry handgun of choice for some time. Uh, this next one is uh, one of your favorites, Dave. Why don't you take it away? I love when the 50 cal Desert Eagle is shown in movies. It's such an impractical handgun in real life applications. It's deafening rapport. It's violent recoil. But actors always make it look like uh, like a little pea shooter. Mm -hmm. uh, that's it's the iconic handgun used by Agent Smith in The Matrix. Naturally, as a computer program, I guess he wasn't too subject to recoil. Yep. And it's also the, uh, the, the, the handgun that Bullet Tooth Tony shows off in Snatch. If you'll recall, he's accosted by some thugs. He points out that their pistols say replica on the slide, whereas his says 50 cal Desert Eagle. And he also fires a thing with no recoil. So maybe I'm just missing out on some kind of technique. However, it is effective against aliens as well because it was used in the movie Predator 2 by uh, Lieutenant Harrigan, the protagonist played by Danny Glover. Danny Glover. Movie. Yep. He was carrying a 50 uh, Desert Eagle, which he actually dropped off the top of a building about uh, three quarters of the way through the movie, sadly. Something that also has some firepower but is a little bit smaller is a gun that is incredibly famous from James Bond, and that would be none other than the Golden Gun. Now, it's interesting that the, the book really deviates from what we saw in the movie. So uh, the Golden Gun was the signature gun of the assassin Francisco Scaramanga. And uh, in, the, in the book, rather, it was just a gold-plated 45 that shot silver-plated 45 caliber bullets. However, in the movie, they made the, gun, the Golden Gun incredibly more, uh, for lack of a better term, spy -y. Uh, where they had to use like basically normal items to put the gun together. You need to have a fountain pen, a lighter, a cigarette case, and a cuff link. And he had the one bullet for the gun in his belt buckle. Uh, and so this, this is one that's uh, a little bit smaller. Uh, it was a single shot pistol that fired a 4.2 millimeter bullet, which is about 16 caliber. Pretty tiny. But there's another James Bond gun that you're pretty fond of. Dave, why don't you take it away? The Walther PPK, none other than. 
yeah. uh, you know, rose to prominence being used by slightly unsavory people, to say the least. And actually, if I'm not mistaken, the PPK was first seen in Dr. No. Uh, but actually, Sean Connery in the movie was actually carrying a Walther PP, not necessarily a PPK, uh, which is a different model, which is kind of interesting in my opinion. Now, one of my favorite rifles of all time has to be none other than the M41A Pulse Rifle from Aliens. I remember watching this movie a bazillion times as a kid, and I absolutely loved it. It's interesting because the director, uh, James Cameron, basically wanted to do Vietnam in space uh, with the Colonial Marines. And so uh, they took the series from Ridley Scott, which did Alien, of course, and transitioned to this, and they used the M16 as a kind of a baseline idea for the platform for the pulse rifle. You'll notice like when you have the, the M203 grenade launcher underneath the M16, it really has that similar profile as uh, the pulse rifle does in the movie Aliens. But actually the gun itself is made from a Thompson M1A, uh, M1A1, excuse me, submachine gun and a sawed off Remington 870 for the grenade launcher. They used a heat shield and the action handle from a Franchi Spas 12. Did a lot of composite aluminum work, painted it green, and you're good to go. Eliminate as many xenomorphs as you can possibly find. And now, uh, this one's a bit of a dystopian future uh, handgun as well. Uh, Dave, why don't you tell us about this next one? Judge Dredd it was a comic book turned into a Sylvester Stallone movie, and they mm -hmm. made an even cooler version of it a oh, few yeah. years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a judge in, in whatever horrible hellscape they live in, they their judge, jury, and executioner. So it does away with due process. It does away with ridiculous inconveniences like, like habeas corpus and trial by jury and evidence. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a fascist sweat dream. Oh, yeah. So Judge Dredd had a handgun, which was voice operated. Don't give anyone any horrible ideas, because can you imagine trying to activate your handgun by voice during a home intrusion? Forget about it. I mean, I uh, would I would love I've got my Glock 34 here and I would love to just tell it to, you know, switch to high explosive rounds at, you know, a moment's notice. Yeah. Also good for home defense, the high explosive round. Um you could switch between normal ammo, armor-piercing yep. ammo, high explosives, like we said, ricochet, which sounds like it's just going to kill you too, incendiary, heat seeker, gas rounds, and of course the stun shot energy pulse. Uh, I don't know how one magazine fit all these things, but you know, it was a comic book. What are you going to do? Talking about more future guns here, I think we're going to need a multi-pass for this one because we're going to the fifth element and we're going to talk about the Zorg ZF-1 pod weapon. Now this is, uh, if there was a gun that you said, I need to do everything, this is it. Uh, in the movie, uh, the antagonist, is, his name is Zork, really cool name, uh, basically presents this weapon to these group of alien mercenaries that has a gazillion different modes that it can do. It has what they call the replay button. So you shoot the first round and that acts as a homing beacon and you can literally like point the gun behind you and the bullets will come back to where that first round hit, which is, I can only imagine how that would work out, but hey, it's the future. We can do whatever we want there. Uh, and then, of course, what would a, a multifaceted weapon be without a rocket launcher, an arrow launcher, a net launcher, uh, a flamethrower, of course, and they referred to it as the ice cube system, which you could freeze somebody with. I mean, this is your do-all rifle, to say the least. But actually, another movie that I watched probably a gazillion times as I was a kid that I always wanted to have this one, and if you do want to have this rifle, you can actually get it. I'm talking about Quigley Down Under and the 1874 Sharps Buffalo Rifle. Now, this one was carried by Tom Selleck's character, whose name was Matthew Quigley, in the 1990 movie Quigley Down Under, and is uh, basically was a modified version of the 4570 government was the cartridge that fired. It was a 45110. Now, this actually does exist, and you can get it. He claims that the rifle can shoot out past 1,200 yards. I'm going to say with a flip-up iron sight, that's going to be a heck of a shot. Uh, but honestly, the gun was part of the movie. It was part of Matthew Quigley in the movie. And it is, it's such an iconic rifle, uh, you know, the way that it was portrayed in that movie. And it actually is on display at the Brownells facility in Brunel, Iowa right now. Uh, it was gifted to the family by Tom Selleck after the movie. 
another iconic movie that I watched a ton uh, as a kid, uh, and obviously I learned the phrase yippee ki from it, was Die Hard. And this rifle that came into play was wielded by one of the antagonists in the film. The name was Carl, and it is the Steyr Aug, or A-U-G. The Steyr Aug. That's what Bruce Willis shot in Die Hard, which is one of the coolest movies ever because it proves you don't need shoes to shoot dudes. <laughs> Perhaps the most iconic scene in the movie is when the antagonist Carl assembles the rifle in an elevator by inserting the barrel into the receiver. Designed by Steyr Manlicker, the AUG is a bullpup design with a 16-inch barrel chambered of 5.56 NATO and capable of 680 to 750 rounds per minute in full auto fire, which means you get to shoot the thing for about a quarter of a second before you got to go scrambling for another magazine. The bullpup design moves the trigger group in front of the chamber to help reduce overall length down to 28.15 inches, not an inch longer. Carl used this as his weapon of choice when chasing John McClane. Now, Dave, this one I know you wanted to talk about. This is our probably most iconic movie firearm of all time. Dave, take it away. Dirty Harry. You got to put it out there. The Smith & Wesson Model 29 chambered for 44 Magnum. Yep. You know, when Elmer Keith conceived the 44 Magnum, he was really making a deer hunting cartridge. We have Dirty Harry to thank for uh, people seeing the 44 Mag as a self-defense round for better or worse. Smith & Wesson was not at all ready for the demand spike caused by uh, by Dirty Harry. And, and revolvers were going for like three times the original MRSP. I think they only picked it because it was so big and it, it really popped on a movie poster. So it's funny, you know, S&W just had no idea they had a hit on their hands and they had Dirty Harry to thank for it. Now, I know we've covered our top 10 favorites. Uh, if you made it this far, make sure you click that like and subscribe button down below. Leave us a comment of what your favorites are. But there are a few honorable mentions we have here at the end that we're just going to touch on really quick. And uh, let's start off with the first one. Uh, this would be the revolver in The Godfather, which was the Smith & Wesson Model 36. Uh, Dave, what's up with this one? Well, I just really love this scene, Chris. And of course, that's when uh, Michael Corleone kind of ducks yep. into the bathroom and pulls the taped revolver from the from the tank of the old pull chain toilet yep. and comes out and uh, and avenges. He, he avenges with it. It's true. I remember the line from that movie uh, before that scene happened. Michael Corleone's brother said, "I." and I remember the TV edited version, which I'll use here for YouTube because it's family safe, says, I don't want him walking out of that bathroom with a stick in his hand. Of course, he meant something else. Uh, I, but, love, I love TV editing. Oh, my gosh. Uh, R-rated movies. Like, if you ever watch Casino, mm -hmm. <laughs> I see you, you cockroach, you. <laughs> Such a classic. And now another one that, uh, you know, used uh, definitely an interesting weapon, to say the least. But uh, in this one, we're going to talk about the 12-gauge silencer in No Country for Old Men. Uh, can you really silence a 12-gauge? I think theoretically, I mean, the shot is going to be cradled by its wad, mm -hmm. uh, unless it's a felt wad, in which case I don't. I think the, the pellets would get stuck in the baffles and probably blow the thing up in your hands. But, you know, in fairness, it wasn't even that realistic to begin with because the, the shotgun that Anton Chugar uses in that movie didn't come out until seven years after the movie was set. So maybe you're not supposed to dwell on the silenced Remington Model 1187 semi-auto shotgun that closely. Fair enough. Uh, you know, a little bit of creative license there uh, as far as the shotgun's concerned. I do know that they do make 12-gauge silencers, guys, but I just kind of question their, uh, you know, applicability. And then, of course, perhaps one of the other greatest sci-fi movies out there, none other than Star Wars. And, of course, we're going to talk about the Han Solo C-96 Blaster. Now, Dave, what's up, the, what's up with this one? So when they made Star Wars, they actually took a real Mauser C-96 and just taped some sci-fi looking detritus to it. And, and uh, Harrison Ford had his handgun. I think the most interesting thing to say about it is that antique firearm dealers nowadays are extremely cautious against selling C-96s to, uh, to nerds because they don't want these, these classic and irreplicable firearms to fall in the hands of people who are going to start gluing craft barn stuff to it. Gosh, I can only imagine doing that to a C96 Mauser. Uh, oh, my know, God. A broom handle. I saw oh an gosh. image. I saw a picture on the Internet once. It was an M1 Grand that someone had painted uh, My Little Pony themed. 
Oh my gosh. And and I and I got agina and I passed out. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. So I guess the lesson here is if you're going to get yourself a C96 brew mandal, uh, make sure you don't wear your Star Wars shirt to the exchange. It, it is such a cool little handgun. It uh, is. It's clip fed, mm-hmm. just like an M1. You, you you stick the clip into the top of it. It's got that cool little box magazine uh, in front of the trigger. It it just it just looks. Unlike anything today, I wish they would start making replicas because I'd seriously consider carrying it. That's a semi-automatic that Winston Churchill carried during his service, you know. Yep, absolutely. And the last thing they want is, uh, you know, more antique firearms, uh, you know, with My Little Pony or, uh, like you said, stuff from Pottery Barn slapped on it. Guys, (laughs) guys, that is our top movie guns put down in the comments what your favorite movie guns are maybe we missed one what are some that were iconic to your childhood to when you were growing up or movies that you just watch over and over again and you can't get enough of let us know down in the comments make sure you click that like and subscribe button and we'll see you out on the range